Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. In this video, we're gonna talk about ready positions with the handgun. This is another, unfortunately, contentious point of debate among the shooting community, those people out there on the internet, uh, classes, things like that. Uh, what are the acceptable ready positions for a handgun when it's out of the holster? Uh, how should you hold it? Why should you hold it that way? What are the advantages, disadvantages to adnasium? All these different uh, opinions based on belief, uh, common sense, research, or experience. Uh, and what I'm here to tell you is that the ready position of the handgun doesn't matter as long as it is efficient. Now, I'm gonna say that again for the kids in the back. The ready position does not actually matter as long as it is efficient. Now I'm gonna tell you why. It doesn't matter because in order to define this is the best ready position or this is the best ready position, you kind of have to predict in what situation the firearm is being used, in this case the handgun. Well, why am I holding it? Well, why is it out? Well, if our handgun is out outside of a range environment, there's probably a reasonable expectation that the handgun is going to be used. So we're talking real life, right? So we're preparing ourselves for real life self-defense shooting. If that's the case, how can someone say this is the ready position you're going to use when they don't know what situation you're actually in? Which is where the it doesn't matter as long as it's efficient comes into play. But we actually have to talk about what efficiency is. This isn't in an attempt to insult anybody's intelligence or understanding of the word efficiency but it is kind of a vague word if you think about it. What does efficient really mean? When we're talking about a ready position with a handgun, efficiency basically means the easiest ability to put the, take the handgun from a safe muzzle direction into a usable envelope for shooting. So regardless of the position I happen to be using based on the situation, I'm able to as quickly as possible get the handgun to work, to acquire my sight picture if I have the space and time available to do that to actually be able to shoot the gun. So that's what we're talking about with efficiency. So when it comes to the ready position, as long as it's efficient, and efficiency to me in this case also means safe, uh, the position doesn't really matter. Of course, nothing is ever that easy, right? So uh, I've got my handgun. Uh, primarily, I'm gonna be a left-handed shooter for, for the sake of this video, and generally I am. Even I can you know shoot both hands, but I just still prefer with handguns, I favor my left. Uh, how do I hold the gun if I'm not actually aimed in on my threat, be it, you know, one hand or two hand? Uh, comes back to, it depends. What's the most efficient way to hold the gun? If I'm in an environment where I have a lot of horizontal concerns, there's a lot of no shoots, if you will, then I'm probably going to try to keep my gun pointed in the direction where it's safest. Makes sense, right? So if I have a threat at gunpoint and I'm using verbals and things like that, what I want to do is be able to keep my gun in that plane. Keep it pointed at my threat. If I'm in my house and it's a home defense situation and I'm kind of creeping around for you know whatever reason, whatever my motivations are, then this might not be the best plane to keep my gun on if there's other adults in the house that I know aren't threats and I don't actually know their location. In that situation, down might be a safe direction. It can be a simple two hand down, like a high compressed ready, or you can even use the sewel if that's something you're into. If I have small children though, and I'm in my house and I'm looking for my bad guy, if there is a bad guy. And of course, if I have kids and there is a bad guy in the house, I'm probably going to move to make contact with that bad guy versus waiting for him to come find me. Say if I'm, you know, single and I don't have any children, there's no reason to go search in the house when I can just call 911, stay in the room, wait for him to come to me. But working on the assumption that I do have smaller humans in the home. Maybe that sewel position might not be such a good idea. Maybe that low compressed ready might not be such a good idea if I'm gonna use terminology like that. I might go with an actual muzzle up position. Now, the internet has been made well aware of a position called temple index, which is just high above the ear, thumb just above the bridge of the ear. There's some variations there. And the whole reason for that position, it's a movement position. It makes a lot of sense inside of vehicles, but it also makes a lot of sense inside compressed environments in general, which is kind of a separate conversation. It's not a ready position. It's a movement position, and there's a de definitive difference there. But muzzle up is still a safe direction to point my gun if I'm concerned with smaller people, and I don't want to be muzzling kids or anyone who's below that horizontal plane in which the gun is usually going to be kept. Now, when it comes to maneuvering around people in a, in a less static environment, the position of my muzzle may change multiple times. And you know what, guys, I've talked about this before. There is no one true direction of muzzle safety. Muzzle safety has to change dramatically with the situation. It cannot force the situation to change with it. So there's definitely a difference between what would be commonly referred to as a ready position 
and what would commonly be referred to as a movement position. Like I said, that high temple index or muzzle up or whatever you want to call it, that's more of a movement position. It's in order to navigate a compressed space or as a secondary uh, benefit, be able to get the muzzle high off of potential no shoots. Now I understand like pointing the muzzle up, if the gun negligently discharges, that bolt's gonna come up, that bolt's gonna come down or it's gonna go into the ceiling. Great. If I have a known no shoot, that's gonna take priority over an unknown direction. That makes sense. If I know I've got small kids in my house, muzzle down can't be the position I use just because I'm worried about if there's an ND, I want the bullet to go on the ground. Well, the bullet can go on the ground or it can go to that small child. So if I know that I have no shoots in the direction where I could otherwise point my gun safely, uh, the no shoots have to take priority. That's kind of common sense, right? Now, some people say, well, I could keep it high or high compressed up, you know? And I'm like, okay, cool, that's fine too. And that goes back to there is no one true safe direction. The situation dictates the safest direction to point the gun in. But I would consider this to be a movement or a navigation position. It's not going to be a ready position. I'm not going to start here and then as the timer goes off, press out and shoot. It might not be a good idea to get, or might be a good idea to get reps like that just because, again, you don't really know how to predict the future. Uh, but it's not something I'm primarily going to use is what I would consider to be a ready position. For me, I have two ready positions when I'm actually on the gun, and that's high ready and low ready. But again, high ready and low ready mean different things to different people. So my high ready is pretty straightforward. I consider high ready to be looking over the sights, but still within the envelope to shoot. So if I have a threat at gunpoint, I'm pressed out. Here's my sight picture. Here's my high ready. The reason I'm bringing the gun down is so I can hard focus on the threat or the unknown and actually kind of um, appreciate the fine detail of the environment. This used to be more of an issue with iron sights on handguns. With iron sights on handguns, guys had a tendency to hard focus on that front sight like they're supposed to. But they'd be high ready and they'd come into rooms and they'd miss everything the gun was blocking and they'd be hard focused on that front sight so the background was blurry, as it usually is because that's the way the human eye works. Uh, high ready was kind of a thing that kind of evolved to get guys off that hard focus and have more of a soft focus or just have the gun in their peripheral vision so if they needed to come back to it they could but they were depressed enough that they were mentally making that switch of okay I need to be looking down there versus at the front side of the gun. I still use high ready because it's a it's a quick position to get the gun back into service but it allows me to keep someone at gunpoint if I need to. The whole reason of keeping someone at gunpoint is if I'm issuing verbal commands and looking for compliance, I don't want to come off my gun all the way back here because time is a thing. Uh, if there's no compelling reason to bring the gun back in, then I'm going to keep it out there and use that as a motivation technique to get them to comply with the verbal commands. Then we have a low ready. Uh, I think, and this is just my experience, but I found that low ready is probably more controversial, different low ready techniques than, than high ready. I think most people can come to a general consensus on what high ready is and kind of how to find it. If you explain it to me, I'd understand what you're talking about. But low ready is, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a position that, that there's, there's so many different variations of it. It's really hard to settle on one definition that would make it easy for me to talk to somebody about it without physically explaining what I'm doing. So if I say low ready, three people are going to see three different things in their mind. Uh, and that's to be expected because there's a lot of different flavors and a lot of different teaching techniques out there. What is low ready versus high ready? To me, a low ready is if I'm in a situation where I have a reasonable expectation to make contact with someone that I may need to point my gun at, but I am searching. So in a low ready position, uh, and we're not talking low light, we're just talking, just got my gun out. In a low ready position, I'm not gonna just come off my gun, I'm actually gonna compress the gun back in. This opens up everything. I can see a little bit of the gun in my downward peripheral vision, but it's not, it's not creating any imp imp impediment, I should say, to my ability to assess a situation. So if I'm actually searching for an unknown threat, or there may be a threat, I'm having my gun out because of that reasonable expectation, such as like a home defense situation, and I don't have any muzzling concerns down, uh, I might keep that gun at a high compress. Uh, to me, this is a low ready position, even though a lot of people refer to it as a high compress ready. Uh, another low ready, in fact, the most, uh, I should say, venerable or, or historical low ready position has been actually pointing the muzzle down, which at some point became the Sewell position. I don't really care for straight arm muzzle down. The reason being, I've got that curve up to bring the gun in, whereas from here I can get the same deal and be able to punch the gun out and get it into work much faster. Don't take my word for this. Try these positions on a shot timer if you like and see which one allows you to get your sights back and get that first round downrange faster. Many, many people have discovered on their own that it is much easier to maneuver the gun 
just using your primary hand versus keeping both hands on the gun during the maneuvering. And that's absolutely true. The reason, uh, historically, uh, at least as, as, I as I understand it, and what actually makes common sense to me just based on my interaction with students and teaching, is the reason two hands were put on the gun regardless of positioning is because it keeps you from doing um, stupid things. Uh, we have this inner limb interaction. Our hands kind of want to hang out together, do the same things together, do the same tasks together, and they tend to gravitate towards each other. And I've seen this many, many times in teaching, especially in CQB, uh, home defense, building, searching for law enforcement, things like that, is someone will reach for a door and they'll muzzle their hand as they do it. So I'm going to go ahead and put that away because that's not a training gun. So a guy will have his little gun right here and he'll reach for the door and he'll muzzle his hand as he turns the door. Well, that's a, that's a pretty significant issue. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, well, he's got to take his hand off of the gun in order to activate the doorknob anyway. And you're absolutely correct. But I've also seen people holding a suspect at gunpoint and talking with their hand, and they'll bring it back into a high compressed ready, and they'll be doing this. If, if I stop using my hand to speak during verbal commands, the guy is still going to understand me, right? If I just do this but don't talk, is he going to understand what I'm trying to say? If I'm literally just like... He might get the gist, but if I have two hands on my gun, I'm like, hey, go ahead, get on your knees, down, slowly, slowly, slowly. All right, go ahead, cross your ankles, sit back on your ankles, do not move. I didn't have to use any of this for that. Now, this is coming from a guy who does talk with his hands. I get it. When it's time for me to go into verbal command mode, I make a conscious effort to do everything I can to avoid talking with my hands because there's nothing more annoying than a guy who talks with his hands and he's got a gun in it. So again, that was the reason that two hands on the gun was, was, was necessarily instructed. You'll notice if you put two hands on your firearm versus one, it's a little bit harder to maneuver. You lose a little bit of your mobility, especially in, in physicality of, of maneuvering small spaces and things like that. But it adds additional safety to the gun. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to a one-handed grip if the situation demands it. Uh, I do it all the time. If I've got to negotiate a doorknob, I'm going to be like, okay, muzzle up activate and then as the door comes open or as I push the door out of the way then I can go back to that two-handed grip. Uh, if I'm dealing with uh, having to push individuals out of the way or something like that, it, again I have to take one hand off the gun. Before I do that my preparatory mo motion is going to be either muzzle up if the situation allows it or muzzle, high, muzzle compress down. I generally gravitate to that muzzle up position unless there's a prevailing reason not to point my gun into the air uh, because Humans don't fly, and I'm not worried about ghosts. So I understand that people are going to be connected to the earth and rise to a height at least or slightly over mine versus being floating around above me. Now, I understand people talk about, well, dude, there's like two-story, three-story, four-story, five-story buildings. You're absolutely correct. There are. <laughs> um, there's also other rooms in buildings, but you're still pointing your gun at the wall. Uh, I, I did not really big on, on the, the super fine details of, of structural integrity when it comes to the building of multi-story buildings, but I'm pretty sure, I, I, can, I would actually bet a, uh, a pretty good sum of money on this, I'm pretty sure that the construction of a floor is going to be more robust than the construction of drywall. Kind of get my point? If I'm okay with muzzling a wall even though I don't know what's on the other side of it because that's what I'm doing, but I'm not okay with safely muzzling into a ceiling. Again, you don't want to shoot around into either one of them unintentionally. But kind of my point is people have got this mentality of ups bad in two-story buildings and blah, 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 blah. But they're perfectly okay with muzzling a wall when they don't actually know what's in the other room yet. Uh, there's people today, uh, probably, maybe even watching this video, who are doing dry fire in an apartment building. Probably maybe sometimes pointing at a target on the wall or their television. Uh, who's on the other side of that wall? You got a neighbor over there? That's uh, something you might want to reconsider when it comes to your dry fire practice. Now, I know nobody wants to hear that because that, now that just made your dry fire life uh, harder, harder to do. Um, if you don't have uh, a known surface that's safe for muzzling, like my, my, my house, I have concrete walls. Yeah, I, might, I have a ricochet concern um, on the other side of drywall, which kind of acts as an anti-spalling, not really. Uh, but I also have a bullet trap. Uh, it's a small one, but it's good enough for dry fire. And a, a rubber bullet trap for the purposes of dry fire is not super expensive. And I know what you're thinking, like, okay, that's just getting super, super complicated. But it's not. 
uh, it's getting super, super safe. And it's something that we need to consider when we talk about safe muzzle directions and, and ready positions. Uh, so going back to, to what I originally said, uh, as long as the muzzle direction, direction is efficient, then it doesn't matter where the gun is pointed. And safety is part of that efficiency because it's a, a, if a position is um, quick but not safe, then it can't be efficient. Uh, and I know that's adding a little bit of a definition to the actual dictionary definition of efficient, but when it comes to shooting and self-defense, I consider safety to be part of efficiency. A technique cannot be efficient if it's not safe, because if it's not safe, then it's probably not going to be consistent. And if it's not consistent, it can't be efficient. I'm Aaron Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.